Hi, everyone. I have some big news that I want to share with you before we get to our podcast today. I wanted to let you know that Path 11 TV is actually launched. However, we are going to be throwing a party on November 11th at 11 a.m. with Suzanne Northrup. She is an evidential medium, and she's going to be talking with us about mediumship and after-death communication on November 11th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then after that, Suzanne has agreed to give people who sign up for a yearly membership a free gallery reading over Zoom. So the readings necessarily aren't guaranteed, depends on how many people sign up. Um, But once you sign up for your annual membership for $59, we are going to email you the Zoom link to enter into the gallery reading over Zoom with Suzanne on 11-11 at 12 p.m. So we are really, really excited about this. And we decided to discount the annual membership by 40% off the regular price until our launch on November 11th. Once November 12th hits, the price is going back up. So I would really love for you to take advantage of your annual membership for $59. With that, you are going to get free access to a gallery reading with Suzanne Northrup. And you can check out her website if you haven't heard of her yet, SuzanneNorthrop.com. And uh, if if you sign up before November 11th, you will be able to enter into that Zoom room with her. And hopefully you will get your own reading. So head on over to Path11TV.com. You can register for that annual membership now for $59 and start watching all the content that we have. There's some wonderful stuff on there. I know you're going to enjoy it if you love listening to our podcast. Oh, and by the way, If you've just been listening to the podcast, we have the video um, podcast for Path 11 over on Path 11 TV. So you can't see them anymore on YouTube, but you can watch them for free at path11tv.com. All right, guys, let's get to our show. Hi, and thanks for tuning in to the Path 11 podcast. I am your host, April Hanna. At the Path 11 Podcast, we are here trying to deliver leading-edge research on consciousness, healing, and metaphysics. And just like you, we are trying to answer the big questions about life. Who are we? Why are we here? And what is our purpose? We hope by listening to our podcast, it will make each day you live on Earth a little easier to understand. And now for today's podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Path 11 podcast. I think we have a very fascinating, intriguing, and uh, just amazing conversation to be had today. It's a conversation I've never had really with anyone on the Path 11 podcast. We've talked about life after death, but I'm speaking to an archaeologist and mu- museum curator today, Pitof uh, Biankowski, and uh, he has been a professor of archaeology and museology at the University of Manchester, director of Manchester Museum, Chair of the Northwest Federation of Museums and Galleries, and before that, Head of Antiquities at National Museums Liverpool. For many years, he was editor of Levant, the Journal of the Council for British Research in the Levant, and editor of the British Academy Monographs and Archaeology Series. And he has written a book called Where Airy Voices Lead. And it's really the only book to comprehensively describe the varying historical and contemporary cultural beliefs in immortality globally, including Western, Eastern, and animist traditions. So, Pitaf, welcome. Hi, April. Thanks for talking to me. Yeah, it's, you know, this is a really interesting topic at a really interesting time, you know, as we're going through this worldwide pandemic. And I think a lot of people have been questioning their mortality. There's been a lot of fear. And um, I know that you are going to bring us through educating us about what you have studied throughout the years with all of the different ways in which different cultures uh, look at what happens in the afterlife and life after death and the many different traditions. So I guess my first question to you, maybe as a young boy, what type of family did you grow up in and how were your first beliefs formed in what happens when we die? Well, you can probably tell from my name that I'm from a Polish background and I was brought up uh, in a Polish family, uh, traditionally Roman Catholic. So right from the right from the beginning, right from an early age, I was introduced to the um, to the to the Catholic or Christian offer. Of, of immortality, so um, that uh, we would um, resurrect and go to heaven where we would live forever and ever. Um, and, you know, as a young boy, I 
I considered this. I thought about it quite a lot. Um, and it scared me because I tried to think through practically what would living forever and ever with no end actually be like? I mean, literally millions and millions of years and then millions and millions more with no end. Um, and I, I, I actually got quite quite scared. And I think I, I decided that uh, I was uh, more scared of the idea of immortality than of, of the idea of death. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it makes me think about a lot of the consciousness uh, researchers and explorers that I've interviewed on the Path 11 podcast. With, and they basically say that, you know, we are energy, we are consciousness, and consciousness does not die. It just changes form. So um, what are your thoughts about that? Well, the idea of uh, consciousness changing form is is one of the uh, the elements in the, the way different individuals or different cultures have um, have have thought about immortality. I mean, if you th think about the word immortality, it seems to be this sort of over uh, uh, all encompassing single word. Um, but in fact, you can break it down culturally in the way different cultures have uh, tried to. Uh, understand uh, immortality or try to overcome death. And so uh, quite a lot of them have thought about individual immortality, that it's important that the individual personality, the sort of the I survives, and that might be through um, resurrection, which you see in, uh, in Christianity, in Islam, um, in Judaism, or through the immortal soul, which you uh, have in the same religions, but you also had um, in ancient Greece and, and Rome, or you might have it in in some in some cultures, the idea that there is a transformation after death, but there's something of the individual that survives, and they survive um, in the in the community. They may be transformed, but they some survive as some sort of ancestor. So that's some sort of individual immortality, and and in the more modern forms of uh, reincarnation which aren't, aren't about um, um, losing individuality. They're about constantly being reincarnated in order to develop, in order to learn. And it's all about improving um, the potential for human life. But then, then those uh, cultures, largely the, um, the Eastern religions, where immortality is very much about the loss of individuality. So you may have reincarnation, and that is about learning and development, but it's about learning to um, lose your absorption in self, to lose this idea that we're somehow separate from other people. And once you achieve that enlightenment, as they call it, then you become part of, you know, the universal soul or something. So you're no longer an individual. And therefore, the, the world that we live in is in some way an illusion of separateness. And what we're trying to do is achieve the sense that we're part of a, a universal soul. So that's a very, very different understanding of immortality. It's not about the individual. It's not about self. Um, it's about everything being together. And then, of course, if there's no, um, if none of those forms of immortality are achievable, the other type of immortality is symbolic or proxy immortality. So it's through children or fame or being part of something long lasting that uh, outlives, proceeds and outlives the individual. Uh, and in the very earliest stories we have about immortality back in the ancient Near East, um, nearly 5,000 years ago, the um, the, the famous hero Gilgamesh seeks real immortality. He wants to extend his life on earth, but he realizes that he can't achieve it. And he learns that, in fact, the only immortality he will have is through fame and through his, um, through his children. So these are all the different ways different cultures have uh, tried to, um, to, to understand what happens uh, after death. And going back to your, your point that con consciousness is an element that simply transforms. Yes, that's in there. Um, and it's 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 one one of the ways different cultures, especially uh, more what I would call animist cultures. So a lot of the indigenous cultures, you know, Australian Aborigines, Na Native American uh, um, Indians, for example, um, if you uh, think about their animist traditions in a philosoph philosophical way, then it's about consciousness transforming into something different. But it actually remains as part of the community. It remains in the land. It remains in the landscape. 
Yeah. And so through your research and as you're researching all of these different cultures, did you find it interesting that there's kind of, you know, pockets and groups that may explain uh, this concept of, you know, mortality, immortality in some of the same ways, but different language and others um, could be contrastingly different? Um, You know, is it is it curious to see consistent themes throughout in studying this? I think there's two ways of um, of answering this. One theme is the enormous amount of borrowing you have between different traditions and also the way certain things are borrowed and then changed to fit in to a different uh, culture. So, for example, a lot of the details of um, the uh, the way the Jewish, Christian and Islamic religions um, envisage heaven, you know, where we go after we die, uh, or for instance, the uh, the Celts in their idea of the other world, all of that was sort of borrowed and adapted from the ancient Greek idea of Elysium, which originally was a place where the privileged and the heroes went. It was, it was a different place for what happened to everybody else who died. It was a, a, a beautiful, uh, or a bit like a pleasure garden, really, where it was a beautiful uh, temperature, uh, lots of um, lots of water, lots of fruit, lots of greenery, um, and especially uh, nowadays in in the way heaven is uh, explained in Islam, it harks back to the idea of uh, Elysium from um, um, from ancient Greek. I mean, the word paradise, for example, uh, that's actually a um, a Persian, an old Persian word, which meant uh, an enclosure or a garden, a park. Um, And it was originally used, um, translation of it was used um, for the Garden of Eden in um, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And eventually it came to mean heaven itself. But again, it's the idea of you know a garden or a park. You know, so this idea of a of a pleasure garden. So that's that's one thing that I'm actually particularly fascinated by the way borrowings are adapted and interpreted to fit into cultures of different uh, values and understandings um, of the world. But then there's another way which. Um, I sort of bring out um, a, a little bit in in my book where every voices lead, which you you mentioned, the the earliest um, explorations by humankind of immortality are in the texts of the ancient Near East. I've mentioned um, I've mentioned Gilgamesh, um, going back five thousand years. There, the the understanding of the cosmos was that there was an earth on which human beings lived. There was a heaven which was just for gods. So humans or certain humans might visit there occasionally, but they could never stay there. And then there was an underworld where everybody went to die. So this wasn't really a form of immortality. This was a sort of a a bleak, continued existence where everybody went irrespective of virtue or lack of it. So this wasn't anything about being good or bad. You simply went to the underworld, end of story. And the underworld of the ancient Near East and of uh, uh, the classical world and and of the um, the early biblical world, the un- the, the, the underworld of the, uh, the Hebrew Bible, um, is this sort of bleak continued existence. What's interesting is at exactly at the same time in Egypt, so it was the neighbor of the ancient Near East, at exactly the same time, you have a completely different understanding of um, of the afterlife after death, where uh, where ancient Egyptians strove to have um, uh, an existence that was actually remarkably similar to the later Greek Elysium, and actually Elysium could have been borrowed from from Greece. So it was a it was an afterlife of pleasure gardens, of orchards, of fertility, uh, which every ancient Egyptian tried to um, um, tried to achieve. And I've tried to think about why, at exactly the same time, in neighboring cultures, you have two completely different understandings of what happens after death. One is, in the ancient Near East, that you just, you go to an underworld, you know, irrespective of who you are. In ancient Egypt, you have this beautiful heaven, paradise. Um, And the ancient Egyptian documents do talk about the um, um, the, the, the fact that um, what, what you do in life 
your um, uh, whether you're doing good or evil will have an impact on whether you can go to that uh, that afterlife. So a lot of the Egyptian um, documents, um, the so-called Book of the Dead, are all about taking the person through the process of uh, asking questions about their life and have they been good or have they been bad? Will their will their 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 deeds be lighter than the feather of truth, for example? And so, so it's completely completely different um, uh, understanding of, of what happens at death uh, and afterwards. And I think the only way you can explain it is that um, environmentally, Egypt was completely different from its neighbours. It had the Nile, but the Nile flooded annually um, and gave Egypt this remarkable fertility um, once a year on which it... Uh, um, on, on which it uh, depended. So Egypt has often been called the gift of the Nile. It's a, a phrase from the um, ancient Greek uh, historian Herodotus. He called Egypt the gift of the Nile. So while the ancient Near East had the big rivers of the Tigris and Euphrates, they didn't flood in the same way that the Nile did. So anybody living in Egypt became aware that this was a very unique special landscape which gave them uh, unbounded um, fertility and what's interesting in the understandings of life after death is that you could only achieve the afterlife in Egypt if you were actually buried in the land of Egypt so everything was bound up with the land of Egypt and the understanding of the afterlife was the most beautiful aspect of Egypt it was like a recreation of, of, of ancient Egypt um, in the afterlife. So if, for instance, you were drowned at sea, you wouldn't achieve the afterlife because your body wouldn't be buried. If you, were, if you were burnt and you didn't have a body to bury, then you wouldn't, be, um, uh, you wouldn't achieve the afterlife. If you were living outside the land of Egypt and, you, and when you died, you didn't come back to be buried, you wouldn't achieve the afterlife. And there are ancient Egyptian stories which talk about the, um, um, the, the terrible misfortune of those who um, are, for instance, uh, uh, engaged in Egyptian imperial activities outside, outside Egypt and die and don't come back to be buried. So everything was about the land um, of Egypt. And I think that probably explains why there was a, a, a completely different approach to understanding the afterlife than to their absolutely contemporary neighbours, who they were in touch with. You know, they, 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 had, um, they, they had physical and diplomatic and trading contact with these um, other cultures for thousands of years. And yet, they had a very, very different um, uh, understanding of the afterlife. I think the other thing to say about the ancient Egyptian and afterlife is from what we know, it is quite elitist. We, we know very, very little about um, the ordinary people in ancient Egypt. Almost all of our, um, our evidence is from the elite. So, you know, the kings and the high officials and the priests, etc. And, and sometimes they could, you know, they could all be, you know, one person a king, a priest, and a high official. Um, and it was they who had the resources, the wealth, to create uh, all these um, backup plans to make sure that their, their body and their soul would uh, live again uh, in the afterlife. Whether the ordinary people, the vast majority of Egypt, whether they had a similar understanding of the afterlife, whether they had their own extremely modest strategies to try and achieve it in the way the uh, the elite did actually we don't really know so from what we know the egyptian approach was quite elitist again completely contrasting with the ancient near east where everybody regardless of status regardless of virtue or lack of it went to the same bleak underworld yeah, you know, as I hear you describing that, one of the things that um, comes to my mind, and I'm not sure if you're curious about it too, are all these rules. <laughs> you know, even in like the Catholic religion, you know, if you do this and do this and do this, you go to heaven. If you don't do this and don't do this, well, you're out of luck. Um, you know, in the uh, Egyptian culture, like you were just talking about, if you die in water, you don't you don't obtain it. If you die in fire, you don't. And 
what was running through my mind was like, well, where's the proof? How do they know? Like, so if somebody died in fire, like who actually knew if that person obtained the afterlife? And what are your thoughts about all of these rules that religions, you know, have in regards to this? Well, you're right that one way of looking at certainly uh, most of the mainstream religions is that they they try to ease the fear of death by offering some sort of afterlife. And it's usually in return for adhering to some set of principles and actions that that religion deems good. And I'm going to put good in inverted commas. Um, So, you know, there are there are good actions and there are bad actions. Um, And, you know, the bad actions in religious terms tend to be called evil. Um, So in those religions, if there's an afterlife, if there is a heaven, for example, then the rules are that those who have uh, acted well according to the precepts of that religion will go to heaven, whereas uh, at least in some some religions, those who have acted uh, in a way that's bad or evil according to their precepts will go um, somewhere that's uh, you know not so nice called uh, called hell. Um, but the what's interesting historically is that uh, certainly within. Christianity, Judaism, uh, and Islam; these ideas of heaven and hell—they're—they're uh, they're all, they're all interpretations. And in a sense, you can you can see historically when they when they when they start when they start being talked about, and they're talked about then for centuries in all sorts of different ways. So, to answer your question, well, how do you know? Has anybody ever been there? In most of these religions, there is a um, a strand of writing which is about journeys to heaven and hell. So they take the form of uh, somebody uh, going um, on a journey, sometimes just through heaven or sometimes through heaven and hell, and then coming back and telling everybody about what they've experienced. Um, and it was a way that these religions um, try to show um, how you ought to behave and what, what is in store for you if you act in, uh, in certain ways. And there's a very long tradition of these uh, uh, journeys to heaven and hell in all sorts of religions. You have it in Christianity, in Judaism, in Islam. You have it in, um, in uh, the Celtic um, religions as well. Um, and in in the earliest ones, uh, for example, uh, a lot of it is to do with um, uh, meeting uh, prophets and uh, seeing where uh, God resides and uh, looking upon the face of God. And sometimes you go through uh, areas of heaven or different levels of heaven, which are about uh, uh, punishment for for your evil acts for your sins and so it's 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 punishment a lot of it especially in the medieval period was about um uh, all different sorts of tortures depending on what sort of sin you had committed um you would have uh, different tortures which were particular uh, to that uh, particular uh, sin and therefore when the person comes back from their journey and tells their uh, their fellow, their co-religionists, what they have experienced. This was a way of uh, trying to persuade them to act in um, in certain ways. And of course, the I mean, the most the most famous um, of these uh, these journeys is um, Dante's Divine Comedy, where he goes on a journey to hell and then to purgatory um, and then to heaven. But that came at a very, very long line of uh, of these journeys, which had gone on for, uh, I mean, best part of one and a half thousand years by the time Dante wrote. And a lot of the themes uh, that he, he picks up were traditional in those journeys. Uh, so he didn't actually originate them. He was simply writing them um, in an incredibly beautiful way. And that's why the Divine Comedy has become the most famous of those journeys. So another question that I have, are there any cultures or religions that do not believe in a higher consciousness, higher intelligence, a God or a deity? Because, you know, I'm kind of thinking about just certain um, religions that I'm aware of, like, say, there's Buddha, Shiva, Jesus, God, Allah, um, Native Americans would be the Mother Earth. Do you find that in all of these cultures that there is 
everyone is basically pointing to something of a higher intelligence that we're either praying to, looking to, makes the decision. That's a, that's quite a difficult question to answer because sometimes um, I think there, there's quite a lot of um, inconsistency um, within within religions. I mean, you're right. The, the the very the very earliest evidence we have of any religion at all is in the ancient Near East, um, and there you have the gods who are some superhuman in some way. They are the creators of of, of the earth. Um, they are the controlling powers. Um, and what they what they demand of humans is obedience and worship, and you can influence the gods by um, um, by praying to them by being obedient. But the, the gods, in a sense, represent natural forces. So in the ancient Near East, in Egypt as well, um, and a lot of other cultures, the gods weren't weren't just a um, like a, a single creator god, like you have in the monotheistic religions like Christianity, Islam, um, or Judaism. They were gods that controlled and represented the natural forces, so life, fertility, growth. Um, and they so they were the gods of the... You know, that, that's how you, you influenced the sun, the rain, the wind, um, all the things that you needed in order to, um, in, to live in the ancient theory. Some people say that well, all religions are about, um, are about trying to achieve immortality. Um, but actually, I would argue that certainly for the ancient Near East, that's not really true. That even though uh, our earliest records do talk about people trying to achieve immortality, in fact, mostly religion was about trying to um, influence the gods who were seen to control fertility, um, growth, and life, and things like that. But um, I mean, to go back to your to your question. The, yes, in some of the Eastern religions, you have uh, Buddha um, or Shiva, but actually, the um, what the religion is about isn't about a creator god or a single god or an all-powerful god. It is actually about the unity of everything, that everything is one. And that's what, through their life and through a series of incarnations, they are trying to achieve. So my my impression is that sometimes um, in a lot of the religious documents of these uh, of these cultures, in order to try and understand concepts, they are uh, these concepts are made more human-like or yeah, anthropomorphic because it's easier to explain something if you think you know there's a particular god that is controlling it. But actually the whole essence of those religions is that there isn't anything separate. It's it's the complete lack of separateness. There is no separation between um, between uh, individuals um, and between uh, the uh, nature or you know anything. There isn't anything super superhuman. We're all one. Mm. So that's yeah, very interesting. Now, with all of your studies, is there any anyone in particular that you feel most in alignment with when you think about death or your own mortality? Like, is there one that you're like, yeah, you know, I kind of like that. <laughs> I like that one. I think I'm going to subscribe to that. Or do you find yourself staying neutral in the whole process? And what, what are some of your personal uh, beliefs? Well, I mean, I told you about the... Um um my by my, my earliest childhood that uh the, 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 it was a typical catholic childhood and the panic uh, i felt when uh, thinking about um uh, eternal life in in heaven and obviously as a as an archaeologist uh, i've been introduced to all these different forms of uh, belief in the um in the afterlife i mean you can't you can't curate an ancient Egyptian collection, like I did for, for 20 years, without thinking about their understanding of immortality a lot of the time, because most of what they created, certainly everything that was found in tombs, which makes up you know 90% of what we have in, um, in the world's museums, was created in order to, um, to ease their passage uh, to the afterlife. 
Um, but also a huge influence on me was working with um, different indi indigenous groups in Australia, in New Zealand, in North America on the repatriation of the human remains of their ancestors, because this brought me into direct contact with very different uh, living perspectives on death, immortality, and time. And we've talked a little bit about this already, about these animistic beliefs. But in those cultures, the dead, even the long dead, I mean, going back hundreds, thousands of years, they continue to be regarded as persons. Their consciousness, if that's the right word, remains a sort of animating force in the body, in the community, in the land, um, in the landscape. So that had a big impact on me. And it's partly as a result of how different those beliefs are from you know, the classic ones of you know, Christianity, for example, or Islam, that when I was writing the book, Where Every Voices Lead, I really wanted to be as objective as possible. And what one strand that I hope runs through it is that I describe all these um, um, all these uh, uh, cultural beliefs globally across uh, across the millennia. Um, but I try very hard not to privilege any of them. I try very hard to um, uh, describe them in their own context, you know, in their own environment, because that's the only way we can really uh, understand them. And I have a chapter where I look at what um, modern science thinks about all these forms of immortality. Um, and in a nutshell, uh, modern materialistic science, science essentially um, uh, excludes most of them. It says, well, they're actually impossible um, because nothing exists outside the material body. So having used um, the scientific critique of all these different forms of immortality, but then sort of responded to the critique on behalf of those um, of those the, the, those beliefs. I then apply the same critique to materialistic science because I think that's only fair. And the conclusion I come to is that each of these beliefs, including materialist science, has lots of explanatory gaps. So, as you're to answer your question, as I'm thinking about each one, I think, yeah, this actually this makes a lot of sense. And then I look at the critiques of it and I think, yeah, actually, that makes a lot of sense. I can see that it doesn't quite hold together. But I then go through this process with every single one, including materialistic <laughs> science. Um, but one of, the, one, one of the things that I think irritates me is that, um, is that sometimes scientists uh, and philosophers dismiss quite a lot of these beliefs as incoherent and irrational. And in fact, they're not. Not a single one of them is, because they're all based on perfectly legitimate philosophical understandings of how the world works. And in fact, if you carefully and objectively pick apart the explanatory gaps of materialist science, you'll actually come to the conclusion there's a lot that's incoherent about that as well. Right. So my 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 rather, it's not a short answer, it's a long answer to your question, is that, in fact, I tend not to plump for any of them. And especially in the book, I tried really hard to be fair to every single uh, one of them, because I think that was uh, that was important. There's a lot of books written um, uh, excluding all forms of immortality, or there's a lot uh, from the proponents of particular sorts of immortality, um, whether it's um, uh, Christian resurrection and the immortal soul or reincarnation, talking about how this is the, you know, the, the one and only single truth. And they may well be right. But the point is, they all have explanatory gaps. We don't know which one is right. So I think it's important to have a book that uh, puts all these things objectively saying, well, here are the pros and cons. Here's the historical record. Here are the pros and cons. Um, it's fine to, uh, to believe uh, in one or the other. But in the end, we can't be sure. So don't don't dismiss all these other beliefs because uh, the other person may well be right. That's very true. <laughs> I, you said it perfectly. It's like, yeah, none of it can really be proven. We're not really sure. But yeah, why why dismiss it? And, you know, another question, too. 
I, I like the fact that you kind of uh, said so candidly that the thought of immortality really scared you. And when I think about you know, people that I speak to day to day, there is a fear of death. But um, I wonder if people ever really contemplated, like, okay, I may die, or I may lose the physical body. But what happens if I continue on forever? Um, I know some human beings feel just exhausted with their life experience. And it would almost seem nice if we have the choice to say, I'd like to turn off and I don't know, wake me back up and send me in another body or um, yeah, it just seems like a never ending quest. I mean, that th that, that's, a, that's a really interesting point because one of these strands that goes through a lot of cultures and goes back thousands of years um, is that um, immortality may not be worth having. It may in fact be a curse rather than a blessing. And probably the earliest and greatest classical myth about that downside of immortality is the wonderful story of, um, of Tithonus. And that was written in the 7th or 6th century BC. So it's over two and a half thousand years ago. So the goddess of the dawn falls in love with a mortal um, and she asks Zeus to make him immortal, but she forgets to ask for eternal youth. Um, so she as the goddess remains beautiful and unchanged, whereas the mortal Tithonus grows older and older, and eventually she loses interest in him in all ways. And once he can no longer move, she locks him into a room where he babbles endlessly, according, according to the poem. Um, and centuries later, the uh, English poet Tennyson wrote uh, a poem about Tithonus, uh, and in it, Tithonus yearns for death and questions why a man should wish to avoid it. And this strand that, you know, those who have somehow got immortality, there's a strand in so many cultures, so many writings, that they actually wish they hadn't got it. And they're actually doing all they can to get rid of it. And when they have an opportunity to, um, to take a step, which means that, that they'll lose that immortality, they usually, they usually take it. Uh, one, of, one of the strands in... Um, in um, in Gulliver's Travels, one of the places where where he lands in his voyages is about a society where uh, certain people are immortal, and he thinks this is absolutely wonderful and a really positive thing for that society. Uh, but the more he delves into it, the more he realizes that in fact it's a really bad thing because these people have uh, an appalling and sad life. They don't contribute to their society at all, and at the end of it, he concludes that any sort of death would be better than that sort of immortality. Yeah, I, I, I would think so too. Oh my gosh. All right. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. I feel like you covered so much ground in a short period of time. Um, can you direct our listeners to where they can find your book and uh, more information about yourself if they would like to delve in a little bit deeper? Well, I have I have my own website, which is my my name and then .co.uk. So it's Piotr Piankowski .co.uk, um, and I've got a list of um, of my my books there. Brief explanation of what they are, and the the book itself that we've been talking about, the the history of immortality, that's uh, available, as they say, in all the usual places. Um, it's certainly available on. Um, on Amazon, and I have an author page there, so you can click on that and uh, and see what other things I've written. Wonderful. Have you done an audio book? I absolutely love your voice and could listen to it all day. <laughs> um, do you have it on Audible or anything? That, that, that's that's very sweet. No, I haven't. Uh, and actually, you're the first person who said that, so I've not been uh, I've not been asked for that. <laughs> well, I'm requesting it. I would love it. It's so That's soothing. Thank and, you. <laughs> and, um, you're welcome. All right, Pidoff. Well, thank you so much uh, for you, expanding April. our horizons. You gave me a lot to think about. And uh, thanks for answering some of those tough questions. So uh, it was really a pleasure to be in your presence. Thank you so much for this interview. Yeah, it's a pleasure for me as well. Thanks, April. Thanks again for listening, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that show. And don't forget to head on over to path11tv.com. Grab your annual membership for $59. Remember, that is 40% off the regular price. Once November 12th hits, the price is going to go back up to the regular price. So I really want you to take advantage of our launch deal of $59. You get over 75 hours of content that we have on there. And if you register now until November 11th, we are going to email you a private link to the Zoom gallery reading with Suzanne Northrup. 
And if you would like to watch Suzanne and see what she has to say before the gallery reading, you can tune in to Facebook Live, YouTube Live, or watch it on path11productions.com. She's going to be speaking for about 30 to 45 minutes on November 11th at 11 a.m. We're going to take a short break, and then you are going to head on over to your Zoom room and sit there in the gallery, and hopefully Suzanne will choose you and give you a private reading to connect with your deceased loved ones. So head on over to path11tv.com. Take advantage of the annual membership. Remember, the monthly membership does not give you the Zoom link. You have to purchase the annual membership in order to get into the gallery reading Zoom room. All right, guys, take care.